Dear colleagues and uh, audience, good afternoon for the local people, or good afternoon uh, for the uh, uh, foreign people. And uh, welcome to attend uh, Professor Helmut Schoenberg's lecture, uh, the second lecture at Wuhan University. First of all, it's our pleasure to uh, give a brief introduction to the speaker. Helmut Schoenberg is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Munich in Germany. He is a member of the Bavarian Academy of Science in Germany. He studied mathematics uh, at the Free University of Berlin and then to his PhD at the University of uh, Master. Uh, he received his doctorate uh, from uh, Professor Dr. Rodin in 1968. And then he is uh, a professor of mathematics at the University of Heidelberg. Since 1978, he has been professor of mathematical logic at the University of Munich uh, in Germany. Uh, he is the successor of Kurt Schuchten. Uh, he works on a varied uh, fields, uh, especially include uh, uh, proof theory, computability theory, constructive mathematics, and calculus, application of logic in computer science, uh, books and papers in handbooks. Uh, he is one of the editors of the forthcoming handbook of constructive mathematics, which will be published uh, next year in Cambridge University. He is one author of the book uh, uh, Proofs and the Computations, with Stanley Weiner, uh, published by ASL in the series uh, Perspectives in Logic. He is also one author of the book Basic Proof Zero, with Annie Atrosco, uh, published uh, by Cambridge Press 2000. Except for uh, papers in top journals, is also also for papers in Handbook of Computability Theory and Handbook of Mathematical Logic. And uh, uh, he gave two lectures at one university about the normal proof, a uh, normal form of proofs in natural deduction. Uh, the first lecture is about the uh, uh, existence and the uniqueness of normal forms of proof in natural deduction. Uh, held in last uh, Wednesday. Uh, tonight, he will give his uh, second lecture about the uh, complexity of a normal form. Uh, <clears throat> so, for the audience who watch this lecture, will the platform uh, by the Xue Shu Zhi. So, if you have a question, you are welcome to uh, post your question in the chat box. And after the main lecture, our author, our author can forward your question to us. Uh, our video will not include the di discussion part. So be free to, have, to ask questions you will have. Okay, now let's give time to our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Harmel Swinburg. Okay, please. Okay. Uh, could be show my for you? And the computer? Yes. That's what you know. Okay, so I'll play that as I'm showing that. Zoom. Oh, yes. Yeah, could you just share this line? Yeah, I just, I just try it. Uh, okay. It's a moment, it's a little bit. This is Zoom. Yeah. What should I do? Um, yeah. Boston and uh, the Zoom. Yeah, let's do. So I finish. As I will be. Um, yeah. It's okay, but that's not it. Yeah, clinical system, all the same. Yeah, so I don't want both. Sorry, uh, there's a technical problem at the moment. Let's just uh, try to... Okay, take it easy, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Test the lights. Uh, one, this one, right? 
and justice. Yeah. Okay. I think right. That looks much better. Yeah. And two seconds. Okay. Do you see the slide? Yes. Very good. Okay. Okay. So sorry for the delay. Let's uh, start with uh, part two of this series of lectures, which Yong uh, Ching kindly organized. So last time we talked about normal forms in general and uh, proved basic results about the existence of normal forms and the uniqueness of normal forms. And this time I will try to address an important question in the setting which comes up in many forms, and this is about complexity. So first of all, it's an obvious question to ask when we are able to normalize a given derivation into some normal form which with very nice properties like subformula property, we certainly would like to know how complex is it to achieve this normal form. And what I would like to present first is kind of an analysis of how enormously complex this normalization process indeed is. And this is based on work of, uh, on, of Sandman and Orifkov. And in particular, I will use uh, Orifkov's approach here because it's simpler, it uses a language with function symbols, and it's also related to what I will tell you later today. So what did Orifkov do? He produced some examples of formulas in the implies for all fragment of minimal logic, called this uh, formula CI, and they have the following property. If you insist on normal derivations, then we can show, or also show, that you need a derivation of a height super exponential in this index i if you want to have normal derivations with subformula properties and uh, all the nice features of normal de derivations. On the other hand, if you are content with just logical derivations and don't require normal forms, then the height, the necessary height decreases dramatically. So we can prove these formulas linear with the height linear in I. So that means there is a point in using non-normal derivation, namely you get things much shorter. And let me go into some more details on that. So first of all, it's logic. So we need a certain language where we work. And this language has a ternary relation symbol, R, and also function symbols. And we just need two function symbols, the constant zero and the unary function symbol S, which reminds you, of course, of the successor. And our relation symbol R here, this is a relation which takes three arguments and what we have in mind when we state the relation of R takes place at arguments y, x, and z is this equation. So y plus the excess power of 2 is the same as z. And this little formula when you will see in later analysis in this lecture quite a number of times for ordinals as well. Anyway, it's a very simple proposition and in fact we can use logic in an easy way to axiomatize this relation. And we express its meaning by two very simple logical formulas, so-called Horn clauses, just universal quantifiers of implications. And if you think of the meaning of R, then it's quite clear that y plus 2 to the 0 is the successor of y or y plus 1, intuitively. And then the last one, the hypothesis T2, is the following. If you know that z has a form y plus 2 to the x, and z1 has a form z plus 2 to the x, then what in the end we get is that y plus to do the successor of x equals z1. So that's a crucial property of this 
y plus 2 to the x impression, expression. So these are two rather simple logical formulas, and please keep them in mind. We will use them in the next few slides. So how will we proceed? Well, I have to remind you on this embedding of classical logic into minimal logic, which is a little confusing, but that's just a matter of fact. We can view classical logic as a subsystem of minimal logic if we just regard the existential quantifier as not for all not, and similarly for the disjunction, classical or weak disjunction as um, uh, was defined using ordinary conjunction. Now we will look at certain formulas, I call them di here, which intuitively say that there is a sequence of z's of lengths i plus one, that's this one here, with the property that r0, 0, 0 z i and r0, z i, z i minus one, and so on. Let's just keep that in mind and try to get an understanding of what the z i's are. So the z i is the first one, is just one, right? It's zero plus two to the zero, that's one. And the next one, set i minus one, takes the previous one which was set i and raises it to the power of two. So we get two. Next one, set i minus two, again, takes the previous one which was two and forms two to the two, and so on. So what you get is a tower of exponentials of two, and I will use two sub zero to indicate this tower of exponentials of two of height i. So to express these equations here again in a different uh, form, I say that two is two and uh, that uh, two, yeah. We start with that two, we can formulate that two as two sub i, where two sub i is inductively defined with two sub n plus one is just two to the two sub n. Okay, now we would like to work in minimal logic because that's where we have our uh, derivations analyzed in. So this expression in the first line here from this formula, the i is written in the classical fragment that means with a weak existential quantifier, if you unfold the abbreviations here, then it's just a universal quantifier over all our z's, and then you have these i plus one properties of uh, the z i's, which just define them in the sense just explained, and if we assume that all of them do not hold, then we get a contradiction, which in the weak form means we have such sequence of z's. So that's the form that we i. Now, let's go on. We want to have short derivations of the formula di, and in order to obtain them, we need some little trick. We have to build up certain lifting formulas, which are explained or defined here. So we have a zero, which intuitively means for any y there is such a z, such that r y x z. So z is y plus two to the x. And now the next one, the a i plus one, does the very same thing, but the indices y and z in the quantifiers are just relativized to the previous formula a i. So for all y and i, I there must be a z and i, I again with r y x z. And as usual, you can translate it into our language uh, where we just have implies and for all and can use numerology. Now, we can easily see that this formula AI has the nice property that they are progressive in the sense if AI holds at x, then it also holds at sx. And this follows immediately from the definition of the AIs and our hypothesis two, which was a step case. And finally, we can also prove that AI holds for zero if we bring in one again. And the point in these derivations is, these are very simple derivations with a constant height. So the height is independent of the index i, which is due to the fact that the AI are defined quite uniformly. So that's what we first know, and then the next step is that 
our formulas di, which we defined a minute ago, we can derive them from our two hypotheses with a height linear in i. And so we use just these properties of the Lipschitz formulas ai. And now the final observation which of, of did is the following. If we look at normal derivations of the i, which do not use these somewhat complex lifting formulas ai, then we can, by analyzing the normal form, rather directly prove that these are enormously long. So they have at least two sub i nodes. So what does that tell us? Well, first of all, we have short derivations in the lemma up there, but they are complex in the sense that the formulas that occur in it contain a rather deep nesting of universals and applications. And the depth of nesting is related to the index AI of the formulas AI that we use in between. On the other hand, uh, we have the subformula properties of the long derivations with the super exponential height in the theorem. They contain only subformulas of our very simple hypotheses I one and two, and also the formulas the I, which are rather simple. So, quite generally, what we learn from that example is that there is a trade-off between the length of the derivation and then something which I will call the level of the formula or the complexity of nesting of universal in conjunction with applicational formulas. So that's a rather basic observation about the normal derivations, which I would like to add to the existence and uniqueness that we looked at in the beginning. Now, next I come to a rather somewhat different setting. And this has to do with uh, complexity again, but now in a somewhat more realistic feature. Of course, uh, this enormous complexity of normalization, which we just or Stefan and Orkov noticed, this makes these things a little bit uh, difficult to use in real life applications. Now, at this point, I would like to leave logic in general and go to more concrete series, in our case, arithmetic, so theory of natural numbers, where we have concrete data, which are the natural numbers. And again, the normalization plays a major role in such series, because when we compute terms in the language, then that essentially amounts to normalizing these terms. And similarly, when we normalize derivations in this language, then we get some information on what an instance of an existential quantifier, for instance, might be. So I'd like to approach this question of complexity in arithmetic in three steps. So the first step uh, is concerned with the terms in that language. So there is a rather well-known term system which derives or relates to uh, Steve Bellantoni's PhD thesis under the supervision of Cook uh, from the 90s. And this term system is called LT semicolon. And the L is for linear, and the semicolon is for a certain true sortedness. So that's the term system. That's the variant of the well-known uh, Gödel system T which is a system of finitely typed terms with some constants and in particular with structural recursion. That's something that we introduced long ago and it was, it's, it's a very crucial term system. It relates to our derivation terms because the structure is very similar. We have, but we had formulas previously in derivation terms. We had types now and where we had induction in number theoretic derivations and we had structural recursion here. So I think that's a rather well-known and easy to grasp concept, just a system of terms which denotes functionals, possibly of higher type, operating with natural numbers. Now, the complexity of these functions is again huge, that relates to the order of results. And 
our task here is to tame complexity. And one way to tame it was introduced by Bellantoni as thesis. He could find a restriction of primitive recursion in such a way that all the definable functions are polynomial time. And this was later generalized into higher types. And this is the system LT semicolon. I will introduce it in the next slide and give you some idea of uh, why we need these two restrictions. And the nice feature of this system is that everything that you can define in that term system is polynomial time computable. So we have achieved something which is quite important so practically that complexity goes down to polynomial time with respect, of course, to a certain computation model. And here we will don't we will not look at uh, Turing machines, but at a rather more appropriate computational model called uh, so-called directed cyclic graphs. Okay, so that's a term system whose complexity is tamed in the sense that it's polynomial time. Now we've seen uh, in the derivation term representation of pure logic that to a term, a term system and a logical system are closely related. And we do the very same thing here. So that's essentially the curry howard relation that we had uh, last week. And to this limited complexity term system corresponds a limited complexity arithmetical system, which we write as LA, semicolon L for linear, semicolon for two sortedness. And this LA semicolon solves this equation here. So high arithmetic relates to little C, like this LA semicolon relates to LT semicolon, which means or could be interpreted as saying that the provably recursive functions in this system LA semicolon are exactly the polynomial time computable ones. So that's essentially Curry Howard. And uh, why is that interesting? Well, remember, we work in a constructive logic. So we have a proper existential quantifier which can only be proved when we provide an example. Now it's rather obvious that uh, if you have an existential theorem proven in arithmetic, and proven in our constructive logic, then there must be a realizer or a witness of this existential quantifier. And in fact, it's well known that one can extract such witnesses from the proofs by a method which is known under the name uh, realizability or more precisely modified realizability introduced by Kreisel. And what does that mean? That means Whenever we have proven a existence theorem in arithmetic, then we can extract from that proof a term, which when applied to the arguments of our existence uh, theorem, then it will give us an instance of the existential quantifier. So this term may be seen as a program or a function, or a computable function, which realizes original existence formula. And this is quite interesting and also important because when you use this term as a program, then it comes from a proof. So we have a program which can be automatically formally verified that it has no logical mistakes. So that is a question that's crucial in present day computer science and mathematics, I think, as well, that we don't just want to write programs and try them out, and when they are tested well, then they are correct, but we want to be sure that this program actually meets its specification. And so that's well known for hiding arithmetic, and here we have a setting where these terms by construction will be polynomial time, so that means we get more realistic programs if we work in this uh, linear two solid arithmetic. But still that is law. There's still the problem remains which has to be addressed because I only spoke about functions. But there are polynomial time algorithms, not just functions, which are not linear but still 
polynomial time. And there are important examples of the so-called divide and conquer algorithms like quicksort or freesort have this property. And they are not yet covered by what I said, because we have a linear system, so the not linear arguments uh, do not, uh, are not by default uh, covered. And this is a question which is rather recent, and I would wanted to include in this lecture not only classical results, but also somewhere more recent and also more applicable kind of uh, subjects are being treated. And hence, I will deal with that example to some extent and give you an idea of how complexity can be tamed. So let's just start with uh, well, from first things, so we would like to avoid exponential complexity, obviously, we want to be in polynomial time. And the first question we address is where does exponential complexity arise? And I'll give you three examples of very simple situations where complexity, exponential complexity appears. So the first example is uh, when we have two recursions. So we look at a function, I call it d, for doubling a natural number. And then using this d, I will define another function called e, which represents 2 to the n. And now that's done, well, d of 0 is 0, and d of successor n is a double successor of the n. That's obviously doubling. And now from d, we can define e by saying e0 is 1, and e of the successor of n is doubling e of n. Now, this is an exponential function which have, has been defined extremely simple. What is the problem? Why is it so quickly growing, strong growing? The problem is that the previous value, e of n of the recursion, is used as a recursion argument for the d. And secure in our term system to avoid such kind of complexities will be to mark argument positions in arrow types, function types, as either input or output positions. And then we will require that recursion arguments are always input positions. So you are not allowed to substitute a recursion value like e of n into an input position of a recursively defined function e. Next, there is another possibility where exponential complexity arises, and this is a double use of higher type values. Now, let me explain that we define function f as the 2 nth iteration of our doubling function d. So, f of 0 and m is d of m, and f of successor of n and m is just applying f of n twice to our argument m. Well, that's an equation between numbers. Now let's turn it into a functional equation. f of 0 is a doubling function, and f of successor of n is composing fn with itself. Yeah, so that's again, of course, a too complex function. We have to avoid that. And we have, uh, we notice here on the right hand side, it seems quite clearly that in the recursion equation, the previous value of the recursion is used twice. In the harmless way, but twice, and secure is our linearity restriction. We will not allow a double use of higher type output. Well, that's a very obvious uh, understanding of linearity and not really related to Jean Yves Riemann's linear logic. And the final observation concerns uh, iteration functionals. So let's look at uh, functional i of nf, which is just the nth iterate of f. So, for instance, if we now apply this i to the doubling function, then we get the nth iteration of the doubling function, which is again something which we would like to avoid. So, how this i is defined? Well, I only look at the right-hand side where we have functional equation. So, the zeros iteration of f is identity. And the successor of n's iteration of f is just takes the n's iteration of f and compose it with f. Now, 
again, we have a point where exponential complexity arises and how can we avoid it or cure it? Well, we only allow so-called safe types as value types in a recursion. And the safe type is the type with no marked argument position. And here our D has a marked argument position because it was a doubling function defined by recursion. Okay, so that's our basic setup. And now we have to come up with a term system where computational complexity will be restricted to polynomial time. And in this system, as I tried to explain before, we will have to modify the concept of a simple type by distinguishing a so-called input arrow written like a harpoon here and an output arrow. So our types are just built from a base type like Boolean's natural products lists with these two forms of arrow. And we need the notion of safeness for a type, and the type is safe if this input arrow doesn't occur in it. And since this is a type, and we will have variables of type if you would like to abstract, we will also need to distinguish input variables and output variables. And input variables are marked with an overbar. Okay, so these are some basic concepts here. Now let's look at the, our term language. We need constants. Well, first of all, uh, constructors, of course, like the cons for this or the zero or successor for the naturals. But then, uh, so crucially, the recursion operators. And here in this line, you see the type of the recursion operator over the natural numbers. And you notice that our two sorts of arrows, the input arrows and the output arrows, occur. And in particular, the recursion argument, the n down here, this is used as an input for the recursion. So we have an input arrow here for the tau. The tau itself is not used as an input value, but the step function, which takes the present stage of the recursion, takes the previous value, and spits out a new value. This one has an input arrow here when it comes to the usage of the original recursion argument. And there's a similar uh, operation for list, which I will skip here. An important restriction is that this type tau has to be safe. So the tau itself is not allowed uh, to contain the input arrow. And similar to the recursion operator, we have a more simple operator, which will be important later on, the so-called cases operator, which is just like recursion, but in the step, we are not allowed to use the previous value. We just have the natural number input available. So now we can define the terms of our taint term language, LT semicolon. How is it defined? Well, it's built from variables and constants by introduction and elimination rules of the two type forms, namely the input arrow and the ordinary arrow. So what's the definition? That's a little tricky. So we have two sorts of variables, these x bar and uh, x, both typed and also constants of type O. Now for abstraction, things are slightly more complex because we have two abstractions, because we have two variables. We can form an abstraction of an input variable x bar and also one of an ordinary value x bar. Now, of course, in terms, we have introduction and elimination rule as for implication and logic, and we need to, to restrict things led by our intuition from the first three slides in the section. So when we have an input error here, then in the application, we have to require that this S is what, what we call an input term. That's defined uh, at the end of the slide. So S is called an input term if, first of all, all these three variables are input variables. And then in case S is of higher type, which is allowed here, then the three variables, the three type variables of higher type, say, have to be 
input values. So that's for the input arrow for the normal arrow. The linearity restriction comes into play. So if you form R applied to S, then the higher type output variables in both have to be distinct. You've seen in one of the examples that we miss out this linearity restriction for functions, then we get uh, super, uh, exponential growth. There is one helpful restriction here, namely, if this term R here, the left hand side, starts with the case distinction, there may be many cases, and we can allow in these many cases that a function symbol occurs more than once. So we have a special treatment cases of T and R, where in the terms which are used in the different cases of the constructor, we can allow multiple occurrences of output variables. So in each case, one uh, of these uh, output variables may occur. So that's the definition. It's, as I said, it's the generalization of what Antoni did in his PhD model uh, thesis. So next, we want to talk about polynomial time. And that normally refers to Turing machines and number of steps of a Turing machine or a little more elegant is register machines uh, with also steps of the register machine. Here it is convenient and I think also crucial that we use a different computation model, so-called path stack computation model. And I will explain that later on in more detail. But let's first look at it from the third ACU, third ICU. So we would like to represent terms as directed acyclic graphs, or DAG, shortly, where only nodes for terms of base types can have an in degree greater than one. This corresponds to the fact that if you have a base type object like a number, then you can store it in a register in a sense and refer to it many times. So usage of more, one, more than one copy of a ground type object is uncritical. We only have to avoid multiple usage of higher type objects. So that means the in degree in this graph is maybe greater than one if we have a base type. Now, how do you represent terms? If you write them as a tree, it's quite clear. So the terminal nodes are labeled by variables or constants. The abstraction nodes have just one successor, which, are, which is labeled with a variable, input or output and then a pointer to a successor. And application nodes have, of course, two successors labeled with two pointers. And a path tree for such a term, that's called here a path deck, direct to the city graph. Now, I will use this computation model in a minute to address the difficulty that we have for a natural life algorithm, which is not linear in the ordinary sense, but still will be found to have polynomial time. And that's the so-called tree sort algorithm, which I want to describe on this slide here. So L is a list of items, say numbers, and we want to sort it. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we turn the given list into a tree by a function made tree, and then we flatten this tree. That means we look to the tree from above and just push it down on the ground, and then we should get a sorted form of the list. So how do we make a tree of a given list? Well, if it's an empty list, we take the minimal node of, uh, of these trees, so the root, and if we have a list which starts with an A and then the, the rest of the list. So how would we proceed? Well, we would like to cleverly insert this object A into the already generated tree for our rest of the list. And how do we insert? Well, if you insert A in the root, then we just take the, the tree with the constructor C with label A and then two copies of the root. So these are labeled trees. And the interesting point is how we insert an A in a tree with 
root labeled B, and then you, we have two subtrees, U and B. So the whole idea of the algorithm is that we compare this A here with the label B of the tree that we already constructed. And if the A happens to be below B, then we insert it into the left subtree. And in the other case, we insert it into the right subtree. So in that way, you can easily imagine that we get a sorted version when we flatten the tree. So finally, we have to define what flatten is, turning a tree into a list, while well, the root is turned into the empty list. And now if we have a tree with a bottom root labeled B and then two subtrees, U and B, well, what we do is we flatten both subtrees and insert the B in the middle. And then it should be intuitively quite clear that this flatten of a tree is indeed the listed, the, the uh, sorted version of this. Now, here comes the problem with our setup because we have two occurrences of our flat. And that's, of course, a problem because we have a linear term system where this isn't allowed. And the point I would, what I would like to present to you in this section is how to overcome this difficulty. So, how can we? And analysis uh, analyze this uh, flatten constant in the past day computation model, and how can we make sure by modifying the original ana computational analysis of the uh, LT semicolon and still stay in polynomial time? So let's do that. It amounts to estimate the number of steps, the hash t is the notation, that we need to reduce the term t to its normal form. So an f of t is a normal form of t in the same sense as we had normalization before for derivations. And uh, the first of the simple observation is if we have a numeral of type L of n, so just a list of natural numbers, then the number of steps it needs to normalize the concatenation of the two lists is just a cap over of the length of, uh, of that list. That's quite easy. Now comes the trick. So we have this function flatten, and we would like to assign to that flattening of a list u a certain size, which is an ad hoc notion, but it will be useful for our purpose. So this function, which is defined down here, so it's just uh, the number of steps it takes to uh, normalize flatten of u. So this uses a size function, and the size function is just size of c root zero and size of c a of u y v is you give a higher, way, higher size to the first list u, and then you add the size of v, and then for technical reasons you need a small constant. And what we can easily prove is that the number of steps it needs to flatten our u is um, linear in the, or big O in the uh, size of u. Now, what we want to do is we want to show that if our term system, LT semicolon, the one with nice properties, if we extend it by this nasty flatten function, which doesn't fit because it calls its argument twice, that these functions are still polynomial computable, polytime computable. And for that, we have to kind of have a second look of how we prove this result for the plain term system LT semicolon. That was by some normalization process, and I will try to give you some intuition on the next slide. The first thing is we need two notions. We, have, we call the term RD3, which means it's free of recursions and free of defined constants like flatten, if exactly that happens. So we have no recursion, re constant, and no flatten. And then the notion of simplicity is important. Simple, a term is called simple, and it has no higher type input values. So they are kind of dangerous for complexity. Now there are two simple lemmas, which I will not prove, but just try to give you some intuition. 
First one is on sharing normalization. So if T is an RD free simple term, then the pass deck or computation model for the normal form of T of size at most this size function we had before can be computed in a time which is big O of, of size of T squared. That's a rather easy observation. And the next one is the base normalization. Again, if we have a closed RD free simple term of type natural, say, then its normal form can be computed in time O of size T at most square. And the size of the normal form is again, is not again, but is in this case less than the size of T. So that's not difficult to see. And in this slide, I'd like to give you an intuition about the computation model that we are using here, which is closely related to the normalization treatment uh, last week. So remember, we had input variables, these were with the bar variables, and if they are of ground type, then they can be f and in degree bigger than one. So the term lambda x r of x applied to s, so the red x of this form here, is just written out pictorially in, in, on the left hand side. So you have the lambda abstraction here, you have, here you have the term r, and again this x bar may appear many times and it may be even referred to from different other terms. Now, and then we have an application node in our tree. And applied, we apply the term to an argument S, which is written out here. Now, what's the normalization step? Well, we do the obvious thing. We replace this X here, this X bar, by the term S, by just removing all these nodes here and just making new pointers from these three nodes down there to the S. So this S has now input degree three, which is allowed because it's of ground type. And the whole thing is in a certain sense simpler. So this is one step in the computation model that uh, we would like to use and to achieve the result of the one that I'm going to show you. It's quite essential that we have such a computation model. And now the essential step, of course, in this whole procedure is to eliminate these uh, recursion and uh, operators and the functions which occur uh, multiple times, or defined functions which may uh, call themselves many times. So it's RD elimination. And uh, I refer here to the uh, textbook with uh, Stan Weiner, which uh, Yong Cheng mentioned in the beginning, so the final chapter in that book has the details if you want to look at it. So the essential step is this RD elimination, and we can just refine the proof of that simple step, this final step, by just adding an additional case for the flat. So this has to do with counting the, or estimating the number of steps that are necessary when you substitute in the term Tx new terms R, which you know a certain bound on the complexity. And there, of course, is now a new case where this T may be the flattened construct, and for that new case you need an extra argument, which is not difficult, but I don't have the time here to present you that argument. Okay, now, assuming that this is done, then we have our final normalization theorem, which says that if we have a term T, closed in the system LT semicolon plus flatten, then it may be a function type and then it may be either the input or the ordinary arrow, then this T denotes a polytime function where polytime now refers to the number of steps in our pass stack computation. Okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you in this case. So what have we done? Well, first of all, we have started out with a taint term system, taint version of little C with polynomial time complexity, use curry Howard to transform it into an arithmetical system. Then we have solved this equation here. And now we look at the case where we want to 
be able to deal with algorithms which you say uh, divide and conquer method like the tree sort algorithm and indeed we can just extend the arithmetic by a function of Latin and correspondingly extend the term system. And in this new extended uh, linear arithmetic, we can prove that any list can be sorted. So for any lists uh, with lengths at most n, there is a, another list u such that u is a sorted version of L. So that's a theory which we can prove in this theory here. And as I already said at the beginning, when we have such an existential theory in our theory, we can just use standard techniques in proof theory like uh, modified reversibility and we extract a term, the computational content from this proof, which is now a term in this system LT is in Kona plus flatten. And uh, this term can be seen as a program to sort this in this uh, tree sort way. And the complexity of this program is uh, polynomial time. And again, I'd like to stress the main point here that we don't just get an algorithm which can be tested and seems to work, but we get a verified algorithm and the verification is formal. So we can even formally extract from the proof uh, in a certain proof assistant a term and prove that this term is a realizer of the original specification, which is something which is badly missing in present day applications. Yeah, so that was a somewhat complex stuff, but I wanted to make sure that in these lectures, at least at one point, you see something more recent. There's lots of work to be done, because this was just in a particular instance, there are many forms of algorithms where you are not able to stay within the system of the semicolon, so one needs techniques extended to apply this uh, kind of verification technique for programs to such systems. So much work can be done and should be done in this setting. Let me now go back to more general theoretical issues. And again, I would like to talk about first order arithmetic in the standard sense. And uh, the interest here is to study the most complex proofs in first order arithmetic. So we want to go to the limits of what can be done in first order arithmetic. Where can we find such limits? Well, the main tool in proving theorems in arithmetic is clearly the induction schema, or you may formulate it differently as causal values, induction, no, cumulative induction. So in the step you don't only know, you not only know the, that A holds for the previous number, but for everything below X. Now, if you formulate induction in this way, then it's uh, quite standard, uh, quite obvious that it could be generalized. So both schemes refer to the standard ordering of the naturals, but it's tempting to strengthen arithmetic by allowing more general induction schemes. So for instance, on the lexicographical ordering of n times n. And uh, in more generally, we can just take an arbitrary well ordering of the natural numbers and then use what's called transfinite induction. And that's uh, written out here in this formula which will be with us for a while now. So what does it say? It says, suppose that the property A of X is progressive. And this just means the premise here, so this one. Progressive means that you, if you know the validity of A for all arguments Y below X in the sense of the ordering, then you can conclude that A holds at X. Generally, on this progressiveness. Here it is again. And now it's a rather natural question. There are many well orderings for which well orderings you can derive this schema in arithmetic. Quite a long time ago, uh, Gerhard Gensen settled this question completely. And uh, we will look at his results. It is also the first result of some 
natural statement in number theory, which is correct, but is unprovable in ordinary arithmetic. And this is an instance of this transfinite recursion for a certain ordinal, which is called epsilon zero. And to state our result here, what we will do, namely for which value ranks this scheme is derivable, we also have to use ordinals, and so we have to be a little more explicit about the well orderings that are used here. Now, the ordinal is called epsilon zero, and in order to approach Gensen's results, we have to have some knowledge and also some notations for ordinals. And normally, when in mathematics you hear about ordinals, this is in the context of sensory, where you can introduce them rather generally. However, in this case, there is no set theory necessary, and that's also what Gensen did. It's a simple combinatorial setup. You can just, in a formal way, define the objects, which are called ordinals below epsilon zero, in a certain canonical representation, which goes back to Cantor, so-called Cantor normal form. So let we introduce these ordinals uh, because we will need them in all the rest of what I'm going to tell you today. So from now on, ordinal just means ordinal notation to make it clear that this is combinatorics and not sensory. So first of all, we have to say what is an ordinal, and we can't do that outright. We have to define simultaneously with the notion of an ordinal is a notion of an less than relation for ordinals A and uh, alpha and beta. And we do that simultaneously by nudge. So first of all, if we have this list of ordinals, alpha 1 through alpha 0, m plus 1 ordinals, and we assume that they are decreasing in the sense, or we did decreasing in the sense of the simultaneously defined ordering of them, linear ordering, then we just stipulates that this somewhat strange expression, omega to the alpha m plus and so on, plus omega to the alpha zero, with the largest ordinal first, that this again is an ordinal, or an ordinal notation more precisely. Recall that the sum might be empty, so the empty sum is allowed, and that will be denoted by zero, so ordinal zero. Now we are not yet done because we have to simultaneously define the less than relation. So suppose we are given ordinals, two of them, in this so-called counter normal form. How do we compare them? Well, how should we define this less than relation between the two ordinals? Well, there is a quite, quite an intuitive way uh, to understand that. So we look at the beta n here, the exponent of the, the largest exponent of the second expression, and it somehow beats, it eats up all the tail of this first counter normal form where the indices are smaller than, or smaller than this beta n. So we look at the point i here in this first uh, representation of the ordinal such that P4 i, everything is less than uh, the i m minus 1 here. They, are, they have uh, indices which are less than beta m minus 1 i, and only at the m minus i plus first step, the two things are equal, and then all the rest has to be equal. So this ordinary relation holds if uh, we have the property that's stated just here. And then there's one case left out, namely when we extend. So when the m here is larger than the n on the right hand side, and then this thing has just more summons as the right hand side, and we also have a less than reach. Okay, so that's a little bit looks complex, but it is indeed rather easy. So first of all, Let's introduce some notations. We write one for omega to the zero, k for the k fold sum of omega to the zero, and also omega alpha times k for the k fold sum of k copies of omega to the alpha. 
So this an important notion of level, which will come up uh, again uh, later. So what's the level of such an ordinal rotation? Remember that these alphas and the exponent again are Cantor forms. So if you look at the height of these horrendous expressions, then you just take the level of the Cantor form to be one higher than the maximum, the level of the maximum index up here. And uh, then we can define as we had powers of two in the Orlevkov example here we have powers of omega. So we write omega sub k to be a power, a tower of omegas of height k. So omega zero is zero, omega one is omega is one, and omega k plus one is omega to the omega k. So these are all cantonal forms. And it's helpful to relate this kind of representation of ordinals to our intuition of what an ordinal is. So let's look at the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on. And the Cantor's original idea of ordinals was to count beyond the finite numbers. So we ju he just picked the symbol he called omega as to remind you to infinity as just one object which is stipulated above all the natural numbers. And once that's done, then you can carry on. You can take omega plus one, omega plus two, and so on. And finally, after all these, you just put omega times two. Again, you count omega times three, and you iterate this process, and finally you arrive at omega to the two. You add one, then you add omega, and finally you arrive to uh, omega to the three, and again, you iterate this process and you arrive to at omega to the power of omega, which was our omega sub two. Then you get omega sub three and so on. And if you have understood that this construct actually leads to a well or ring for any of these omega to the n, then you have understood number theory. So number theory is exactly able to recognize ordinals being well-founded, which are below epsilon zero or representable in this form, which I just tried to explain. There's one concept which we have to use later on, that's uh, addition. So how do you add to ordinals? Well, the, again, there is this eating up process here, you just delete all the ordinals with exponents lower than beta n, and then you write the result in this form here. And that's an um, associative operation which is strictly monotone in the second argument, but only weakly monotone in the first argument. And also it's not commutative, so one plus omega is omega, and that's different from omega plus one. You will also need a commutative version of addition, addition that's a so-called natural or Hessenberg sum, and it's just done in the obvious way. You just take your two kind of normal forms, one up here, and then you take a commutation of all the exponents, order them linearly, and the result S and links n plus n plus one, and this is the ordinal we obtain. And this is a associative commutative operation which is strictly monotonic in both arguments. Yeah, and here comes Orlovskov trick again in the form which was originally uh, invented by Gensen. It's not now not uh, y plus two to the x, but it's beta plus omega to the alpha. That's a crucial step in forming ordinals, and uh, this shows up in a certain approximation property. So let's assume you have an ordinal of this form, and you want to approximate it from below. Well, first of all, note that if we have an ordinal delta less than our exponent, than our exponent alpha, then you may add to beta k copies of omega to the delta, and you still are below omega to the alpha, because alpha is bigger than delta. And this process is indeed a limiting process, namely, given any ordinal gamma below beta to omega to the alpha, we can find in the constructive sense a delta 
less than alpha in the K, such that our gamma here, which might be close to beta plus the omega alpha, can be estimated from above by beta plus K fold copy of omega to the delta or some yeah. delta less than alpha. So in that way you can approximate ordinals of the form beta plus omega to the alpha. And this will be crucial if we just make an analysis of what can be what initial cases of transcendent induction can be proven in arithmetic. Now, in the next section, we will look at so-called arithmetical systems, which can deal with these uh, ordinal notations. But in order to talk about ordinals in an arithmetical system, we have to code them. You can only quantify our natural numbers, and we understand these natural numbers then as codes of ordinals. So that means we have to set up some effective bijection between our ordinals less than epsilon zero and non-negative integers, so-called real numbering. And uh, to set it up, it's quite useful to refer to ordinals in this uh, kind of slightly modified kind of normal form where we have not just one copy of omega to the alpha i, but finally many copies. So they have also, we have indices ki of multiplication. And then we can require that the alphas are strictly decreasing. And also that our coefficients k are different from zero. And the convention is if this m is minus one, we have zero for the empty sum. Now, how can we code ordinals? That can be done in many ways, and a particularly elegant one is if we use uh, this kind of good numbering down here, where we just use the decomposition of numbers into uh, as a product of primes. So if we have this modified kind of normal form, then we can assume that we already know the good numbers of C. It is alpha i, and then we take the alpha i's prime and the determine exponentiation uh, power of ki. And this is unique, as we know, from number theory, and we have to add to distract the minus one for obvious reasons, and the pn is then the nth prime. And uh, so that's the coding, and now there's also a decoding. So if we have such a coding of an ordinal, and, uh, which is a number now, and we want to reconstruct the corresponding ordinal, we just have to use the extended kind of normal form, we just take omega and now we deconstruct the indices where some exponents appear, and we take the exponents as the coefficients. And this is, it's quite easy to see that this is a nice bijection. And it will be useful to work with this bijection in some explicit form in order to deal with transfinite induction in arithmetic. And here's some notation which we will use. A is called less than B when the ordinal, uh, X is called less than Y when the ordinal coded by X is less than its ordinal sense the ordinal coded by Y. Omega to the X is now a number theory function which is the code of omega to the ordinal coded by X. The Circle plus is just uh, the number theory version of ordinal addition. The xk is just the uh, number theory version of multiplication by k. And then omega sub k just means the code of this ordinal. So that is somewhat helpful and easy. And now let's go on uh, and uh, try to present uh, the positive part of Genson's uh, analysis. So we will aim at deriving initial cases of transfinite induction in arithmetic. So we have to, we want to do that formally in the formal system of arithmetic. So we have to use schemata and it is helpful to have a predicate value P just taking as a constant, as a symbol. And we use it to formulate the principle of Transfinite induction on an ordering uh, is curly lesson. And uh, what we will prove is that if we have any 
ordinal denoted by A or coded by A, which means any ordinal below epsilon zero, then this principle can indeed be proved. And I will show you how this proof is actually done. And what's particularly nice is that this result is optimal. In the sense that if we don't take any restriction here that we are below A, uh, epsilon zero, but if we take all the ordinals, then we have this principle of transparent induction for arbitrary ordinals less than epsilon zero, then we have an uh, independent sentence uh, unprovable in arithmetic. And I think that's that is the first example in history where an interesting mathematical meaningful formula was uh, stated, uh, which cannot be proved in arithmetic. Okay, so now let's uh, tackle these positive questions. How do we prove these uh, positive results? And this uh, follows uh, some early work of Kochutel uh, from Munich. So he introduced what he called an arithmetical system, called it Z from time theory. And it's it's, uh, we can view it as a theory based on minimal logic in, the, in, in our language, just consisting of implies and for all, including equality axioms. And we have to be a little more precise of what is part of this arithmetical system. So the language can be rather arbitrary. It has to be a fixed supply of functions and relation constants. And they are assumed to denote computable functions and relations on the non-negative integers. Among the function constants, we want to have a successor, or S, and a zero, or a constant. And among the relation constants, we will need equality, then our constant P to express transfer induction, and then this uh, ordering relation. Now for our particular concrete ordering of order type epsilon zero, which we had looked at just before. And this P is needed to formulate transfer induction. It acts like a free set variable formula. Okay, so that is the syntax of our arithmetical system Z. And terms, and of course, are built from variables by application, no abstraction here. And uh, we identify closed terms with the same value. And this is one way to formulate, express that our function constants are indeed computable because we assume that we can compute it, and if two such terms compute to the same terms, they are equal. There are, of course, particular terms called numerals, which is the n fold successor of zero. That's a numeral n, that's denoted by m over line. And now the formulas of our language are just atomic formulas with relation symbols and then uh, implication and universal. Now that's the setup of the syntax of the system. Now we have to come up with axioms. It should be an axiom system where we want to derive uh, initial cases of transfinite induction. So we need quality axioms uh, and particular com compatibility of any formula with uh, equality. We need the piano axiom so the successor is injective and it <coughs> Zero is not a successor, and then we need the ordinary induction scheme for arbitrary formulas A. And similar as we expressed computability of functions by identifying a closed term with the numeral it denotes, we identify or we have as an axiom that a relation symbol applied to some numbers n is uh, true or is an axiom of z more precisely whenever this n, r of n is true. And of course, for n, we can also take terms because they denote just numbers. So that's a way to express that our relations are also computable just as functions. And finally, for our ordering, we need uh, some properties. So should be erect, flexive, and transitive. So x less than x is same as falsity, so it implies everything. So that's, remember, we have minimal logic, so 
this thing x as velocity, and then we have transitivity. Well, I gave these uh, axioms some numbers because later on in the proofs I will refer to these numbers, so that it is unique. And here is the list of axioms that was is just copied from Schütte's paper on the subject, which are all quite easy and natural, but let's go through them uh, to because we will need them. So first of all, x less than zero is as good as falsity because we assume that or we express in this axiom that zero is the least element of our ordering, and then it serves as a kind of falsity in our theory. The next thing is, as again, to do with our crucial function, the beta plus omega to the alpha. Is this alpha here is zero, then it's essentially the successor. And we are allowed to do case distinctions on numbers which are below the successor. And if we know z is below the successor of y, then and if we then have two cases, maybe if z is strictly below y, we get a, and if it's equal to y, then we get also a, then we get a outright. So we can make case distinctions for an ordinal which is below y plus y plus one. Yeah, then we need our addition, and, but we only need few properties of addition. x plus zero is x plus is associative, and zero plus x is x. We have to just stipulate that as axioms. Now we have also to stipulate powers of <coughs> omega, so omega to the x times zero is zero, and omega to the x times successor is just omega to the x times y plus omega to the x. That's the definition of exponentiation. And uh, no, it's not exponentiation, but the division, definition of multiplication of a power of omega with the natural number. And finally comes these things which I pointed at uh, some minutes ago, namely, how do we deal with this approximation of ordinals of the form beta plus omega to the alpha, in case this alpha is a successor. And you may recall these two properties which we had a while ago. It's here. So if we have some gamma which is below beta plus omega to the alpha, then we can find something which is bigger than gamma in the form beta plus omega to some delta and some k. And we will now provide some functions for, uh, which gives us a delta and the k depending on what is given here. So let's see where we have that. So if we have something below omega uh, y plus omega to the successor, then we can, the z corresponds to the gamma, then we can estimate from above the same z by an expression which is smaller but concretely smaller, so we can replace this uh, omega to the successor x by omega to the e x, y, z times m of x, y, z, and this e of x, y, z is below the successor. And m is just a multiple, we need that k many times in the first, the, the previous expression. And since e and m plus, and uh, these are all function constants, I is arbitrary formula. So the axioms are just formal counterparts to the properties of ordinal notations that we have observed shortly before. And now we come to the things that really interests us. We would like to prove initial cases of transfinite induction in this arithmetical system Z. And we do it for transfinite induction up to omega sub n, which is the tower of omegas of height n, and for an arbitrary formula A. So it's exactly this thing here which we want to prove. So if we have progressiveness of A completely, then A will hold for any ordinal below, strictly below omega sub n. That this is derivable in set. And the way it's done, this is almost literally the same trick that Olaf got used for these 
analysis of complexity of uh, normal proofs, we again need uh, some sort of a lifting process, which is, was formulas called AI, lifting formulas in, in the Orifkov treatment. And here uh, I use a notation that I step from a formula A to a lifting formula A plus, or with respect to a fixed variable X. And what is A plus? Well, A plus of X says, if I know A for anything below an arbitrary Y, then I know this very same thing for the same arbitrary y, but now increased by omega to the x. So the x here appears as the power of omega, which we can kind of step forward when we want to uh, approach the validity of a. So that's uh, one can notice is that this formula increases complexity in a natural sense, namely. If A has a certain level in intuitive sense, then this A plus has a level one higher because here we need an implication and here we have a universal quantifier. So this nesting of universal combined with implication that is just increasing the level by one. And if you look at the types of the corresponding functions, also the type of these functions will be increased by one. And this is essential to achieve Difficult things like uh, strong growth in, in oral talk and uh, here, like the probability of uh, transplanted induction. Now, the main step in this proof uh, is the following whenever this A of X is progressive, in the sense we yeah, have just seen again here, so that's progressiveness, then also this new formula A plus of X will be progressive. And here again, what means progressive? Arbitrary formula is progressive if it satisfies this property. And to prove that, we have to, of course, use the axioms of our arithmetical system. And it's quite informative that the axioms that, are, that you use are exactly the ones that uh, should have brought in a rather nice and simple form. So let's have a look at that proof. So we want to show A plus is progressive provided A is progressive. So we assume that A is progressive, and moreover that our A plus holds below X. And then we have to show A plus is progressive, that means we have to show that under this assumption, number 13, A plus also holds an X. And let's write it out here. This is exactly unfolding what A plus of X means. So fix a Y and assume the premise and assume some z below y plus omega to the x. That's all written out here. And then we finally have to show this az. Quite a number of preparatory steps, but now having done that, things are rather canonical. So we just distinguish cases on whether this exponent x is zero or successor. And you remember the, may remember the, the uh, properties in the axioms of Z, where we had some approximation of Y plus omega to the successor of Z. This will be needed in the successor case. But here in the zero case, it's sort of simple. We know that Z is below Y plus omega to the zero, and we had an axiom for that case distinction, which says to prove A, we can distinguish cases Z is below Y or Z equals Y. So this is what we have to do. Now, if z equals y, the thing really follows, z is below y, sorry, the thing follows from what we have just assumed here. And if z equals y, then again it follows from this number 14, but now we use the progressiveness of a. So a holds below y, then also holds at y. So we need all that to cover the zero case. And the final case is the Progressive is the successor case here. Let's see, I can point at it, this one. So we now assume that we have something below y plus omega to the successor. And remember this uh, final axiom 11, which said we have a certain approximation to the exponent and also a, mul a multiplier which all depend on x, y, and z. 
So we have this kind of expression, and we know that this E's exponent is below the successor of Z. That was one axiom. Now, by the number 30 that we had on the last slide here, everything below x we know are a plus, we immediately have that a plus is holds for e. And if you write that out, that's getting now a little complex, you get to this formula here, which just says a plus holds for e. If you remember what a plus was, it was just the lift by omega to the e. And that's what's exactly expressed here. And now this can be rewritten using some of the more simple axioms that the v-fold multiple of this uh, omega to the e uh, on the left and the successor of v-fold multiple of the omega to the e to the right. Which means that we get a step in the induction if you want and then from some easy observation we also know the thing holds for zero and then by an ordinary induction we know that this holds for every n and in particular it holds for the multiple for this m which was an initial number and this is exactly what a of z was so this way you cover this crucial fact about uh, transfinite induction so, but the rest is sort of easy, so we now show, now show by induction on n that we can have uh, this scheme of transfinite induction of arbitrary formulas and also for arbitrary ends. And that's sort of easy because we just did the step in a sense. So let's assume that our a is progressive, and then we look at the case zero. So x is below omega to the zero, which means x is below zero plus omega to the zero, and by this property phi, which was very simple, it uh, was x phi, so it allows us to derive a of x from x below zero, as well as from x equals zero, and then we have this one, and we get a of zero from the progressiveness of x, a of x. So that's a little bit, uh, contrived, but it is a very trivial kind of observation. The crucial one is the step case. So if we recall, we assume that A is progressive, and then by what we just proved, uh, also A plus is progressive. Now, by induction hypothesis, we know that everything below omega n is true for a plus 1x, because it's progressive, and we have dealt with our claim with n already. And this means a plus holds for omega sub n, since a is progressive. But by definition of a plus, we obtain that for all z below omega to the omega of n, we have a of z. Remember, a plus was just the lift by omega to the n, so if we have it, then we have it also for omega to the, uh, below omega to the omega n. So that's the set here. Okay, so that's sketchy, but uh, I hope uh, you got the idea of it. How uh, one can prove uh, transfer induction up to n. Now I want to relate uh, this kind of observation to what we did before. And as I said a couple of times, the level of formulas or equally the level of types plays a crucial role in all these settings. Let's be a little more precise and define the level of the formula. So for an atomic formula, you say the level zero. For an implication, you say the level of the implication is the maximum of the level of A plus one and the level of B. And for universal, it's the maximum of level of A and one. Now, where does the level formulas come into what we have just seen. Well, in the induction step, we derive transfinite induction up to omega sub n plus 1, or ax, from transfinite induction up to omega n, but now for a different formula that was a lifting formula. And notice that the level of the lifting formula is 1 above the level of the original formula. 
And if you think about it for a moment, then you see that in order to prove transfinite induction up to omega sub n, you need the induction scheme for z, but for other complex formulas, maybe for formulas of level n. If you write them out, they get a huge, but with this concept of level, you get an overview of uh, what they really are. And this is uh, very close. Let me just jump back to what we had down here. We had these height formulas, and then we had these uh, numbers, uh, towers of two. Yeah, and then we had these uh, formulas uh, AI. Let's just look at the first line here of how this formula is defined. It was uh, for all x in an i that exists in the weak sense of z in an i such that the relation of x of y x z holds. But if you look at the level of this formula, it goes up by one because here the a i has level essentially i, and now we use that in a for all implies setting, which is this one here. Or if it's written out uh, correctly, then we have this kind of formula, which again increases the level by exactly one from i. So these are also formulas of level i plus one exactly as we had it here in our Schütte proof of the transfinite induction. So that was one thing I wanted to get out here. Now I'd like to conclude with an observation which uh, uses this idea that levels of formulas are responsible for this uh, gross, uh, enormous growth that you have in normalization. And uh, it can be even made, or oh, not even, it can be observed already for a completely different measure of complexity, not just initial cases of transfinite induction, but you can also use the rate of growth of functionals that can be proved or can be introduced or defined uh, in the respective subsystems of number theory. And we will approach that by using iteration operators of higher type level. Here's a level, concept of level appears again, but now it's a level of types and not a level of formulas. But you know well that formulas and types are essentially the same concept. And we have a very similar relation as one we just observed in a minute ago to ordinals below epsilon zero. So let's uh, look, see things. Let me first uh, address the issue of growth or grow, uh, quickly growing function, let me put it this way, or fast growing functions. And I will introduce a certain skeleton of the fast growing functions, which is indexed again by our ordinals below epsilon zero. So for every such ordinal, I want to introduce a function with the aim of having functions which grow really fast, uh, depending on how the ordinal is chosen. So we start with something quite fast already. We start with the power of two. So f zero of x is two to the x. Now, what do we do at the successor stage? So if you already know f alpha and you want to define the next function, I already told you that iteration is the main tool here. So we have x and we have alpha, and hence uh, by induction hypothesis, you also have our f alpha. And now it's an obvious idea that to produce something which grows, we just iterate the given f alpha x times. I write it in square brackets as another index. So this uh, f alpha super x is the x iterate of f alpha. So already f1 will be the x iterate of the power of 2. So that's already a hyper exponential function. And we can carry on. So everything is still primitive recursive for finite indices, but it goes very fast. Now, we index them by the ordinals, and there are not only successor ordinals, but also limit ordinals. And the next question is, what shall we do at a limit? 
So what is f lambda of x? And well, okay, uh, lambda is a limit. So we already know the functions f alpha for alpha less than lambda. How can we use them? Or well, we have to refer to them somehow. So we need what's called a fundamental sequence. So given a number x and a limit number lambda, we have to define what the x's approximation to lambda is. That's called fundamental sequence, and it's easily defined for our ordinals less than epsilon zero. And suppose we have defined it, I will come to that in a minute, then at the limit step, what we do is we just take our old f alphas for alpha below lambda and call them at the argument x with lambda of x, smaller ordinal. Now, what's the fundamental sequence? This is, once you think about it, more or less uh, automatic or canonical. So we know uh, that any limit number may be written in this form, cantonal form with decreasing exponents, and so alpha zero must be bigger than zero because it's a limit. Otherwise, alpha zero would be zero and we have a successor. So we already know alpha zero is a limit. Now, how to define the x's approximation to lambda, this lambda square bracket x. Well, we have to look at this alpha zero, the last exponent of lambda. And if this alpha zero happens to be a successor, then we just subtract one from the successor and multiply this occurrence of an ordinal x times. That's the central case, and the other case when this alpha zero is a limit, well, we already then know the approximating sequence of fundamental sequence was a limit, so that's alpha zero of x, and that's what we take. So it's a very canonical process, and it's still an open problem in proof theory how define, to define these fundamental sequences for higher ordinal notation systems. And that's a long story that you may know about the Hilbert extended Hilbert program initiated by Schütter, where we would like to measure by means of much larger ordinals the strengths of certain stronger systems of arithmetic. And then for these stronger systems, one might also ask what are the fundamental sequences, and this is not done in a satisfactory way getting very complex for higher ordinals, but we won't go into that here. Yeah, now let's uh, look at something which is, was introduced by Grigorczyk for primitive recursive functions and can be easily extended to epsilon zero recursive functions. So let's look at a certain complexity class called E alpha. So these are E for elementary, so elementary functions at level alpha. And how are they formed? Well, the crucial thing is that we insert a certain process fast growing function called f alpha, and in addition, some additional functions, projections, uh, then constant functions, addition and uh, multiplication, and then subtraction. And we close under the elementary operations, as uh, and these are substitution and bounded sums and products. So if you use that without any s, you get the Kalmar inventory functions. But if you insert this kind of strictly growing function f alpha, then you get the alphas uh, elementary function at level alpha called E alpha. And these E alphas are very interesting. They can be characterized in many ways. And one characterization of E alpha is uh, highlighted here. So it consists of all functions which can be computed by, say, register machines or equivalently jury machines or equivalently fast x, where the number of computation steps, and these are clear for jury machines, for register machines, and also for fast x, where it's just beta conversion, where the number of computation const, uh, steps is bounded by a finite iteration of our fast growing function in alpha. So they are in the sense a skeleton of these uh, kind of uh, hierarchical uh, destruction of the functions that are provable recursive in arithmetic. 
So the, the, the limit of all these uh, functions are is called the, the set of epsilon recursive functions. And uh, an old theorem uh, originally by Ackermann and uh, later by refined by Kreisel says that these, uh, this limit here consists exactly of the function which are provably recursive in a technical sense, which I won't go into here uh, uh, in original. So one can define a natural subsystems of arithmetic whose true recursive functions are exactly the ones in the alpha. And that would be the subsystems, for instance, where transfinite induction is allowed up to and excluding the ordinal alpha. Now, these functions, this skeleton is, or the extended Kinoji here, he is rather interesting. And I would like to end uh, this course with the uh, rather simple characterization of these functions by a higher type iteration. So you may see that as a study of why it is rewarding to look at objects of a higher type level, the formulas of the types. And if you do that, then you get uh, easy access to increasing complexity and have some, some kind of a measure which you can use to orient your studies. Yeah, what have we done? We have extended the definition of F alpha. Oh, no, we have, don't have it, we will do it. So the F alpha are functions. And now what we do is we remember or recall that the level plays a crucial role. So we will extend the definition of these functions into higher types. And this will be again a very simple process. And in order to do it, we introduce particular types which are called integer types. So uh, called row n, so row zero is the natural numbers, and row n plus one is just the type of unary functions taking an argument of type row n and returning a value of type row n. Now let's look at objects of these uh, integer types. So we take x zero up to x n plus one down here, and we assume that the index of the x is determines the integer type of these variables. So you can, for instance, form xn plus 1 apply to xn because the types fit. And this is an object of type rho n that's obtained from an object of type rho n and x. And this thing again can be applied by, to xn minus 1 and so on. So you can form xn minus 1 apply to xn, then apply to xn minus 1 and so on. And we just abbreviate that as xn minus 1 and then apply it down to x0. Yeah. And again, the level is crucial here. The level of these integer types is just the index, say, how far you get up into the nesting of arrows. Now, that's the definition. Uh, and if you, the definition of the extensions of our skeleton of fast growing functions into higher types. So f alpha n plus one has now type rho n plus one. And alpha again is less than epsilon zero. And the definition that you see here is almost literally the same as the definition of the type one functions, the proper Grigorchi extended hierarchy just with a slight variation because we have more arguments now with different types. So if you take f0, n plus 1, apply it to xn down to x0, well then in the case n equals 0, which was the case we had before, you just take again exponentiation. But if n is bigger than 0, then there is a natural way to use this iteration idea. We iterate xn x0 times and apply it to the whole rest. Now, in the successor step, it's similar. We are given f alpha at level n plus 1. And now we take the number, the only number amongst this many arguments, which is x0. We iterate this item x0 times to apply it down. And the final step is even simpler. We again take our fundamental sequence. We just approximate this lambda here by what this final argument x0 says. So you may formulate it that in a slightly different form by just saying uh, xn 
to the y of uh, this uh, argument tuple, which is, was used in the middle case by means of an iteration operation, which can be defined generally, but let's skip that. And now the crucial lemma, where again our Orlovkov Genson construct beta plus omega alpha features prominently is that this corresponds to application. So if you apply F alpha at level n plus one to F beta at level n, you get exactly F beta plus omega to the alpha at level n. There's one precaution here, so this might be a Hessenberg sum, so nothing should be eaten up by adding omega to the alpha to beta. Okay, so that is to be proven, and the proof is astonishingly simple. You just do an induction on alpha, and the case alpha equals zero is just an easy calculation. I think I'll skip it. But let's have a look at the successor case. So if you apply f alpha n plus n plus one to f beta n and the rest, then by the definition of successor, you get this thing here. And now by induction hypothesis, remember this is an x0 times iteration. Each time you add an omega to the alpha minus one to the beta that you originally had. So you get this expression. And then just by definition, this is the same as fn of beta to the alpha from all these things where you use the fundamental sequence again. So this is again our claim. Let's finally look at the limit case. So if we have f alpha n plus one to f beta n and the rest, where alpha is a limit, then we, as always, we diagonalize the limit by approximating it using alpha of zero. But what is alpha of zero? Well, remember we had uh, an induction hypothesis and this says, tells us that this item here, this one applied to Fn is just the same as Fn at beta plus omega to the alpha x zero, just the induction hypothesis. And then the rest is again trivial. So we get really the exact equation for this uh, higher type uh, Gregorchik hierarchy. So to conclude, uh, this was a study on the strengths of finite types appearing in logic as well as in arithmetic. And uh, we have seen that um, this uh, extended Gilbert here, here to higher types, and in particular the one where you have just functions, they can be built from iteration functionals. It's the only thing that was used from the exponential of two, just by application, nothing else. And the resulting representation of all these functions f alpha, or any alpha, they, they are just formed by iteration, by, by application of iteration functionals. And if you write that out, uh, then you see you do not need uh, that this application pattern corresponds exactly to the Cantor normal form. Just written, uh, interpreted in a different form. And in particular, this kind of unpleasant fundamental sequences go away. You don't need them anymore. You just have the Cantor normal form. Okay, I think I'm at the end of my time. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this little more complex second lecture and uh, would like to conclude. Okay, uh, first, this, uh, thanks, speaker, for the wonderful lecture. Okay, uh, we learned a lot from it.